Previously, on the Roman Campaign, General Licinius, commander of the Second Legion and with the First Squadron, had besieged the city of Taurus, the last stronghold of Epirus in the Italian peninsula. After fierce fighting along the walls and in the courtyard below, our Roman forces prevailed and the threat of Epirus in Roman territory was ended. Epirus, now greatly defeated and licking their wounds, we sued them for peace, bringing a calm and level of stability for Rome. Much of our lands were in disarray from all the recent warfare, with some just barely recovering. To the south, Carthage and Syracuse are waged deep into a war, fighting for control of the Sicilian island. While Carthage is a much larger force than Syracuse, they now have a free Greek ally that is open to assist them in their war. Now that the entirety of the Italian peninsula was under our control, we've declared that our intentions is to strengthen our economy before war finds us with another Mediterranean powerhouse. We will march north and conquer Cisalpina. The lands there are rich and the people are independent from one another, leaving them easy targets if we attack them before they make allies with one another. Controlling the lands at the base of the Alps will also provide us new trade routes to the north if we are able to find new friends beyond the mountains. Regardless, new territories will provide for a larger and stronger Roman military. But we must remain vigilant of the war in the south, for as long as Carthage and Syracuse keep each other busy, we should have plenty of time to march north and conquer what we need. But should the war turn favorable to one of the factions that would look at our lands next, our armies would be far to engage the threat. To the north, there is a world of new discoveries. We cannot imagine to learn what's beyond the Great Alps if we can't even reach it. Rome must expand her reach to the mountains that we may have new resources to strengthen our nation for the fight with the powerhouses of our new southern border. General Licinius, leader of the Nobilis party, has proven to be a capable commander in his victory of taking Taurus. Though he still does not hold any favor with the Senate, we will give him the chance to prove himself further and bring back the favor of the Senate to his party. It is well known that the general is an avid bigot and has no love for any people other than Rome's. I'm sure he will gladly accept the honor of taking foreign lands to the north. With all the legions marching to the north, we will keep first squadron by Taurus patrolling the province until public order can become manageable again. As the legions marched through the Roman heartland, there was much to celebrate as we were able to go toe-to-toe -to -toe with one of the prestigious Greek nations of old that tried to make a claim to the peninsula. But signs of unrest and disarray could be seen throughout the land. The war with Epirus was a costly one. It was a proud victory for Rome, but another heavy war with any of the active powerhouses of the Mediterranean could very much be the end of our Rome's young foundations. In the spring of 276 BC, we would launch our attack on Ganua, but to our surprise and that of the Ligurii people, the Veneti, led by King Coanus, traversed across the mountain passes during the winter and landed a surprise attack on the Ligurian forces. We are unaware of their sudden motives for war, but just like us, they could likely be seeking to expand their control in Cisalpina even perhaps preemptively trying to curb our expansion northward as well. They know that a war with them would spark the ire of the Illyrian people that they neighbor to. Trouble with them would not be to our benefit, for their lands are just across the Adriatic of our towns. However, they were unsuccessful in their attack, and even though the Ligurians were to celebrate a victory, they were greatly weakened. The forces of the Ligurii were split after the battle, with half their army led by General Codus traveling to the foothills outside Genoa, and the remaining forces led by their king, King Oxonos, stayed in town to repair what the Veneti may have damaged. It is unknown why half the forces left the foothills, 
but we can only speculate that it may have been for celebration with their gods in return for their victory. A foolish move though to leave their port town vulnerable as they did not anticipate our forces so close and with ready swords and hot blood. It was now spring and our Roman soldiers have marched north into Cesalpina. We would find remnants of the Venetii camps and even see some of their wounded straggling back through the mountain passes. At that moment, General Licinius, with the First Legion, along with General Papus reinforcing, gave the order to besiege the town. As we neared the port city of Genua, we could still see the remains of the battle that had transpired just the previous season. With great numerical superiority, we crushed the port town of Genua and claimed it for Roman glory. Hearing the news that Genoa had fallen into Roman control, General Codus mustered up his remaining forces that he had at the foothills for one more fight to try to reclaim their home. But their numbers were far too little and unprepared to take on the advancing Romans. So they took to raiding their own fields and farms to keep us from reaping the benefits of their land. But General Licinius quickly repelled the Ligurian forces back into the foothills. Gathering the full strength of the 1st and 2nd Legion again, General Licinius marched on to finish the Ligurian army for good. General Codus made his last stand atop their most prominent hill, lined man to man and shield to shield. As the Romans began to climb the hill, the Ligurians would make one last and final suicide charge at their enemies. With the battle finished, the Ligurian military was utterly crushed. We would let the seasons change, giving our troops time to recuperate and replenish their numbers. Scouts have reported that further north, at the base of the Alps, was the walled city of Midlan, ruled by King Gabranus of the Insubres. Reports have shown that within the walls, they had neglected to carry a strong military. Until our recent approach, they have lived relatively sound in unison with their neighbors, letting the Venetii and the Ligoria sort out their differences, while they lived inside the protection of Midlon's walls. It would be their demise to not foresee the Roman bull charge into the north. Sounding the horns, General Licinius called back together both the 1st and 2nd legions to ready for another campaign. He was hungry for victory and to sway the public opinion back towards the Nobilis party. Marching on to Midlan, the unsuspecting Insubres were greatly alarmed, rallying their militia to stand by in defense for their city. With bows and spears, the Insubres watched as Roman troops formed up just outside their walls. Constructing two large ladder wagons to try to scale the walls and break an entry, the plan was to have two ladder points pushed by skirmishers and attach them to the walls. One on each side of the shorter south wall to eliminate the space that the Insubres bowmen could attack us from. Once the ladders were in place, the skirmishers would fall back as the infantry would then charge the walls and fight to gain a foothold inside the city. The objective of the forces penetrating on the left was to gain control of the gatehouse to allow more troops to enter the city, while the troops on the right wing are to push the enemy from closing off the foothold and if possible, circle around the Insubra's forces guarding the gatehouse and flank them. Advance at speed. The placement of the ladder wagons went exactly to plan, with the men assigned to push them quickly retreating and the first infantry forces charging to scale the walls. Insults, arrows, and death were to meet the first brave soldiers that reached the top of the walls, but their courage led the way for their brothers in arms to slice a foothold on the walls and into the city. Once the initial landing was cleared, the Roman troops began moving into place. Ready the left wing battling towards the gates. Glory. Glory 
and the right wing spending up the Zubris trying to regain lost ground. The fight would continue on for several more vicious minutes until both sides would find a foothold and begin the shield wall grind, pitting the endurance and training of each force against one another. General Asenius and Papus outside the wall on their steeds knew that the battle may come to this if the left attacking force could not secure the gatehouse fast enough, so they rode out to the base of the walls where the fighting was just an arm throws away to encourage the men to continue fighting. The troops fighting on the right wing took the rejuvenated vigor and pushed hard into the enemy, breaking their lines. With that push, the Encerberus troops holding the right line began to fall apart and many started a route from the fight, allowing the Romans on the right wing to begin circling around the structures that would open up the avenues to flank the Encerberus forces guarding the gatehouse. The plan shifted now from having the gatehouse be the main entry point for the Roman reserves to having all the remaining troops that hadn't scaled the wall yet climb over and push forward with the now open avenue on the right wing. During the brunt of the main melee, we employed the skirmishers to run along the backside of the city with a hillside allowed for a small force to access a location where they could overlook the entire city. To their surprise, they discovered that the Insubris King Brownos had retreated to the safety of the upper Where? city. How? What? Just get on with it! Unbeknownst that hidden above him were hundreds of skirmishers armed with javelins. Like as if the sky had turned a hazy ceiling, a hail of javelins fell upon the Insubris King and his entourage. Many were killed, but save a few for lack of javelins that the skirmishers had all expended on them. With the Insubris guarding the gatehouse, now having their flank vulnerable, routing soon crept through their ranks. Romans to their front, and now circling around them, fear instilled in a man leads to dramatic actions. And by surprise, the gates were swung open, but not by the Romans, but by the Insubris themselves. Men that would rather flee to the hills and live than fight for their city, now made a mad dash to what they thought would be an easy escape. But General Licinius and Papus were already at the gates, steeds and swords ready. All who ran out the gates, thinking they'd find a break from the melee, were now in a mad run for their lives. The Romans were now cutting their way through the panicked Insubris. Fresh reserves were climbing over the walls, and word was spreading that their leader, King Vibranus, had been ambushed by skirmishers from the cliffs. In the chaos of the battle, with men running and dying everywhere, several hundred brave Insubris were able to pull away from the West Gatehouse and mustered up for a last stand at the northern city gates. A small party of Roman troops that had chased after them looking to clear them out of the city were chopped down by the undeterred Insubris. They were amongst the bravest and proudest in Subris, but they would not let their city fall until they were killed themselves. A second party was sent to deal with the cowardly king that stood at the top of the city, waiting his fate. The Romans formed up to face this last band of warriors. A final clash of brave, tired, and bloody men would signal the end of the Insubris. And the city of Midlan would now be occupied by Rome. In times of war, we fight for peace, and in times of peace, we ready for war. With the occupation of the port town of Genua and the walled city of Midlan, learning of new foreign peoples and the lands to the north, Rome had succeeded again in warring for peace. The Veneti, after their failed attack on Ligoria, would not pose a threat to the new Roman cities for a time. But in the south, the conflict between Carthage, Syracuse, and Epirus was right at Rome's doorstep. Stay tuned for our next episode as we continue to build Rome's infrastructure, meet new factions, and ready to return south for war. And as always, I'm Yangbang, and I'll see you guys in the next video. Peace out.